Streaming and serving out of Fayetteville, Georgia, you are listening to the New Vision Church podcast, a community to belong, be loved, and believe. Let's check out today's message. And so this morning, um, we are having our final sermon in this series about the Olympics, uh, Fanning into Flame. And I appreciate you all wearing your jerseys today uh, for Jersey Sunday. And uh, one of the reasons we, we did that this week was because it is the last uh, 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 day of the Olympics, uh, closing ceremonies and all that is happening. Uh, but we also are kicking off a lot of different things that, that uh, many of you look forward to. I love football season. Any football fans out there? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Now, I'm not talking about soccer, okay? I'm talking about the real football, okay? And uh, so, so yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, one of the things about it is this, that, that many of you did not know, but we have two softball teams that represent our church. Uh, and they play softball pretty much all year long. And, uh, and so I want them, if you're playing on our softball team, if you guys would just go ahead and stand up so we can recognize you guys and just say thank you for representing us. Yeah, we got a couple in the booth back there. These guys right here. Yeah, John and uh, yeah, Richie. Richard over here, Brandon back there. Yeah, so uh, thank you guys for representing us on the field and uh, representing Jesus for us uh, because, you know, many of us are not athletic that way. And uh, so... It's great to have you out there. And the same thing is true when it comes to the Olympics, right? When we look at the Olympians, we say, wow, we are astounded by what they can do, right, with whatever their, their uh, discipline is. And even more so, right, it should be the same thing for us, that people ought to look at us and be able to say, wow, how are you like that? And we can say, well, it's because I'm on Team Jesus, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not me, it is Jesus in me, right? Now, I'm wearing, I, I'm wearing a Patriots jersey today, yeah. Go Pats, right? Even though they had, yeah, they, they've done, I, yeah, I, I feel the love. Thank you. Um, and uh, I went to high school at the Patriots, right? That's why I wear the Patriots, but now I'm a Brady fan, but, but today I'm wearing Gronkowski, and, um, and that's just because I don't have a Brady jersey. But, but here's the thing, right, is that this is one of the things that we need to understand, is that Gronkowski would have been nothing without Brady, right? I think we would all agree with that, that, that you got to have Brady to have a Gronkowski. And what I want you to understand this morning, if you don't hear anything else, right, we are nothing without Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter. And so it's important for us to make sure that we're wearing that jersey, doesn't matter who else, if I got my name on the back, doesn't matter. If I, if I don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter. And we all need to understand that we need Jesus. Regardless of what jersey you're wearing, right, if you're not playing for Jesus, then it really doesn't matter. And so today, I want to encourage you and hopefully inspire you to consider your relationship with Jesus. You know, we've been talking about the Olympics for the last few weeks, and we've seen a lot of different uh, incredible stories that have come out of the Olympics. And, um, you know, I've been inspired by them. I've been awed by some of their talent and the things that I've seen them do. World records have been broken. My goodness, some world records. I, it's incredible. You see these guys doing the speed climbing, right? Uh, if they had one for slow climbing, I could do that maybe right? Or, or halfway climbing. But I mean, they're going up this, this tower in like less than like 15 or 20 seconds. It's unbelievable how quickly they're doing that. And so we can watch things like that and we can be astounded by how much and how, um, how efficient they are in their discipline. And I want to challenge us as Christians to draw from some of that, right? Because we all enjoy sports. We all enjoy watching these things and seeing athletes do things that are incredible. And in the same way that they discipline themselves in their specific sport, we should be disciplining ourselves, right, in our faith. As Jeff was talking about, you know, Muslims, and many of you have heard this before, but Muslims are very dedicated people to their faith. And wherever they are, I mean, I've been to countries where when, when, you know, when the bell sounds or, or it's time to pray, they stop everything and they pray. I mean, right there are their businesses. They roll out their mats and they will pray. And it's hard for Christians to even pray over their meal. And I mean, and, and if you pray over your meal, y'all have seen some of the drop the napkin prayer, right? You drop your napkin to the Lord, thank you, Jesus, so much for this food, amen. Because you don't want somebody to see you pray. 
right? And so it's, it's just that kind of thing where, where why are we embarrassed, right? People, people walk around all day in Walmart and they're talking on their phone like they're talking to nobody, right? They don't have a problem walking, oh yeah, yeah, she done this, she done that, but we can't, we can't pray. We're so afraid, we're so afraid to pray out loud when everybody else is, is just letting all their business hang out in Walmart. So I'm just saying, right, that maybe we need to reevaluate, right? We need to reevaluate some priorities. When we don't have a problem talking to anybody else, doing anything else, but when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, sometimes we get a little wigged out about that. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and sorry if I'm using some, you know, 80s phrases because that's when I was raised. I, I said this the other day I, uh, to somebody, and uh, I was like, yeah, you know, we want the epicenter to be hip. And they were like, hip? I was like, yeah, as in replacement, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So then Paul says, so run to win. Run to win. Listen, all these athletes out there, and I watched some of these races the other day, and they were running 1,500 you know, uh, meters around these tracks, and I was on track and field one time. And I'm telling you, when, when, I was, when I saw that finish line, man, I was so happy it was over. But I, even though I knew I wasn't going to win, I knew I wasn't going to quit. And this is one of the things that we need to understand is that, that Paul's saying, when you enter into this race called the Christian faith, you need to run to win. Winning means not quitting. Winning means you stick with it. He says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I, uh, in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul is saying this. Listen, this is the greatest apostle that lived. He wrote, you know, about half of the New Testament. And he's saying this, that I'm going to continue to do this because it's not about what I've done. It's about me continuing to the end. That's what it's about. And he said, I'm doing this because I have a fear even by myself that, that I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want to, I don't want to miss out. So he says, I'm going to keep running, and I'm going to keep doing what I need to do. So today we're going to focus in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. And uh, we're going to take this apart a little bit and see how God may encourage or challenge you in this final message to fan into flame, right? To, to not let your fire grow dim, to not let it be extinguished so that you might accomplish all that God wants for you. We all know that Paul has written to Timothy, and this is a second letter going to him. <clears throat> and in chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, Paul kind of gives these final challenges to his young protege. It's very possible that Paul knew he was going to die soon, and so this is kind of his you know, final words to someone that he loved dearly, but also someone that he commissioned into the ministry. And so he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Now we could stop there, and that would be enough, wouldn't it? That, that, that if, if God wants you to hear anything today, I think it would be this. Be diligent in preaching the word. Be diligent in studying the word. Be diligent in spreading the gospel. And then he goes on, he says, so be ready in season and out of season. And then he says, in doing that, you're going to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience. Some of y'all need to highlight that, right? <laughs> Your exhorting has been like exhausted. Exhort with great patience and instruction. So he's not just saying, don't just tell people what to do. Sometimes you got to show people what to do. Right? It's not enough just to tell people because, let's be honest, sometimes the instructions just go in one ear and out the other. This is why another thing about going to Clarkston, right? It's that, that we need to show people Jesus' love. We need to show people God's love before we can tell them about it. And then verse number three is so important for us in the, the day and age we live. For the time will come 
when they will not endure, and again, this is important, they will not hold on to, they won't continue in sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you... Be sober in all things. So he's talking to Timothy here. He's saying, Timothy, look, don't be discouraged whenever people start leaving your church. Don't be discouraged when people get tired of hearing the truth. Don't be discouraged, Timothy. Keep doing the right thing. But you be sober in all things. And then he says this, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And then Paul says, for I... Already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. And then he has these incredible words to say. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, here's where you come in, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You want to get a crown when you get to heaven? The way you get the crown is endure to the end. The way you get recognized and awarded when you get to heaven is that you keep going all the way to the end. You run and run and run and you keep running until he comes back. So three things I want to highlight for you this morning. And the first one is this. There is an incredible charge. An incredible charge. Charge! Right? That's kind of what Paul is doing here. saying, hey man, look, don't stop. Don't sit back. No, you got to go. And sometimes, right, this is, what, this is what happens. Is that sometimes the church isn't taking the lead. The church is sitting back waiting for someone else to do it. And that's not the way it should be. That, that God has left us here to be the ones who are actually causing and creating the change. If you remember in Acts, right, that Paul was hanging out with some other people and, and uh, they were causing a ruckus. Uh, and, uh, sorry, another word that you guys may not know. But, but a ruckus. They were causing a fuss, right? And all these things were going on and, and Paul and all these people had to, they had to get out of town and so they came to Jason's house. And they said, Jason... Where are those people that have been turning the world upside down? How would you like to have that title? Are you a person who's turning the world upside down? Now we know it's really turning the world right side up, right? But to everyone else where up is down and down is up and good is bad and bad is good, right? When, we, when we're doing the right things, it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem very odd to everybody and they're going to be like, what is going on? Oh, the Christians were here. The, the followers of Jesus were here. The ones who love God are the ones who are doing this. And it is amazing. It's amazing. So there's an incredible charge. Paul says this, I charge you. And, and listen, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, I believe these words are for you too. He says, you need to understand this is coming in, in the presence of God. And he's going to judge the living and the dead. Don't think you're going to escape God's judgment. Each one of us are going to stand before the Lord one day and he's going to judge us based on our lives and what we did with Jesus. Everybody. Everybody's going to stand before him. And so he says, you need to remember to whom you belong. We've talked about this for the last couple of weeks, right? It's all about who you belong to. Listen, I can't just walk out to the Patriots with this, with this on and, and, they, uh, and they're going to let me play. I'm going to be like, I got a Patriots, I got a, I got a jersey, man. I got the jersey. Listen, even if you showed up, well, I don't know, if you showed up for the New Vision team, they might let you play anyway. But, <laughs> but, but you know, the thing about it is this, is that you can't just show, you can't just expect to show up with your Jesus t-shirt on when you get to heaven and say, hey, I'm on the team. He's going to be like, no, you ain't. Just because you got the shirt on, right, doesn't mean you're part of the team. You got to have Jesus on. You see, God's going to filter everything through Jesus. Everything. And so it's important for us to ask ourselves that hard question, right? Do I belong to Jesus? 
Am I one of his children? And by the way, just because you're alive doesn't mean you're one of his children. A lot of people think that. But the Bible says this, that you become a child of God when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That God becomes your father at that time. Yes, you are part of God's creation. He created you and he loves you. But you're not his child until you receive Christ as your Savior. But if you've done that, if you've done that, then you need to remember that you belong to him. And it's God, up to God to what part you play. You know, there are people all the time who, who sign up on teams and they say, well, I want to play that position. And the coach says, sorry, <laughs> you're going to be out on this position. You say, well, I'm really good at this. And you know what? The coach is like, well, I don't care what you're good at. This is where I want you. And sometimes we come to God and we say, well, God, I'm really good at this and I really want to do this for you. And God says, well, that's great, but I've got something else I want you to do. And you know, your answer should be, yes, sir. Whatever you want me to do, God, because I'm playing for you. I'm playing on your team. And, and this is one of the things that you need to understand is that a lot of times, if you will just do what God wants you to do, you're going to find out that that brings you great joy. Just doing what God wants you to do. So remember that you belong to him and he's going to judge you based on your obedience to him, not on your gifts or talents or whatever. It's going to be on your obedience to him. Did you do what he wanted you to do? And then you've got to remember why you're here. Right? Why am I here? Well, I'm here, as we sang that last song, to bring glory to God. I'm not here to make a name for myself. You know, everybody wants to get their, their names on the back of the jerseys. Everybody wants to, you know, have some fanfare and some kind of, you know, uh, accolades. All these, these um, Olympians are getting, you know, their 15 minutes of fame and getting their medals and all that. And that's great. They deserve that. But you know what? Paul said, we do it for a crown that's that's perishing they, they do that for a crown that's perishing but we're doing this for an eternal crown we're doing this for a crown that will last forever we've got to remember why we're here we're doing these things for jesus christ when you go to churches today you you kind of run you can run into all kinds of different messages people preaching all different kinds of things from prosperity to gloom and doom it seems like everyone's got an opinion on something to say. But I want to remind you that all of these things are not necessarily from God. Everything that somebody says from a pulpit or from, you know, YouTube or from some podcast doesn't mean it's from God. And so it's important for you to know the truth yourself. It's important for you to study the word yourself. It's important for you to make sure that you're growing in your faith so that you can discern what's right and what's not. Just because it sounds true doesn't mean it is true. And what Paul is telling Timothy here is like, he's saying, listen, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to just come and they're going to hear what they want to hear. And if they don't hear it, they're going to leave and they're going to find some place where they're going to hear what they want to hear. That, that people aren't interested in the truth all the time. They're just interested in feeling good. Listen, sometimes as a pastor, I've got to be honest with you. It's hard to get up here and say hard, truthful things. It's things I don't even want to hear, <laughs> right? I, I mean, you don't, as, sometimes, you know, as a parent, you don't always like saying the hard things, but sometimes you got to say the hard things. And God sometimes is going to say the hard things to us because he is holy, because he is just, because he's right, and because he's good and loving. 1 John 4, 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Listen, today, if you don't like what I'm saying, I'm sure you can find somebody who's going to say something you like. But I want to encourage you that even if, right, even if this is not the church for you, that you be careful with whom you listen to, because people are lying to you. People are lying to you. Listen, uh, this morning I, I woke up and um, uh, at like at 3 o'clock. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what time it was, so I picked up my phone and, and looked at it. And I was like, oh, wow, it's 3 o'clock. So I couldn't get back to sleep. So I'm sitting there, and I've been thinking about, you know, I need some new gutters. And so I was, this, this thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I was like, I was like, this, this ad popped up on my uh, Instagram thing 
I guess they knew I was looking at some new gutters or something. And, uh, and so, so it was like, hey, you know, you get, you get this discount. And so I was like, oh, a discount. So I filled in the information and right. And so I'm laying there for like 30 minutes waiting for this email to come in. It never comes. I didn't get a text. And I was kind of glad because it was like, you know, 3.30. And, uh, and so then all of a sudden while I'm still laying there, it was like, it was unbelievable. My Facebook account was like hit with like 10 different ads for gutters. And here's the thing. They were all saying, we're the best. We're the best. We're the best. And I was like, no, you're not. Everybody can't be the best. Everybody can't be number one. You're lying to me. Somebody's lying to me. You're probably all lying to me. Right? And this is what we need to understand is that everybody's lying to you about something. And so we've got to be careful with who we listen to. Because people usually have a reason to tell you certain things. My reason for telling you this this morning is because I love you, and because I care about you, and I want you to have a relationship with Jesus because that is, He is the only truth. He is the only way. He is the only life. There is no other way to heaven but by Him. People today are trying to rewrite history, supplement history, redefine what a, a woman or a man is, and even rewriting the Bible. Right? You may not be aware of this, but, but there are so many translations now, and, and even some of those translations are being compromised. And so it's important with what version of the Bible you study. Don't just go and pick any one up. Right? Make sure that you, you get one that is being um, transcribed and and translated, right, from the original text. I want to show you an example of this. And this is one of the things that, that again, you, you think some of these differences don't matter. And some, some of the translations, right, it, it's not a big deal to me when they, when they go in and, and there's a big thing now about gender inclusivity, okay, and about making the Bible, you know, gender neutral and all these kind of things that are going on. And, and yeah, so, I mean, there's... there's any kind of Bible you want to find, you can find nowadays. There's even a, a pirate's Bible. Um, and the, it's been translated so that it sounds like every person in the Bible is, speaks pirate. And uh, I know it's ridiculous, but... Uh, so, yeah, Captain Crunch, yes, yeah, the author. <laughs> and um, so, you know, one of the things that, that as I was looking at this, right, it's not a problem if somebody's translating, you know, where, it, where in the Bible many of us read something like, you know, dear brothers. And so some of the translations go in and they know that, that the congregation is made up of just men. So what we'll put in, right, and this is where some of the gender stuff doesn't really matter, it says brothers and sisters, okay? That's not a huge deal. But there are some other places in the Bible where if you just change a word like that, it makes a big difference. And so I want to show you just one example uh, because of time. But in Psalm 3420, and this is the New Revised Standard Version, okay, the NRSV. This is one of the versions that a lot of times gets uh, used in colleges and things like that. Uh, and uh, it says this, He keeps all their bones, not one of them will be broken. Now you say, what's the big deal about that, right? Well, the big deal about that is that this verse is a verse that points as a prophecy to Jesus. And so if you change that word there, which I have underlined, because in other translations, this is what it reads. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. And so if you're trying to be gender inclusive and you're going to go and change all the words that's, that's his and, and, and make it there, well, that causes a problem because it takes away from who Jesus is. It takes away from this prophecy toward Jesus. And so we need to be careful with what translations you're reading and how things are being translated. And so I would encourage you to do some study on this, right? And so this is from the NASB 1995. There's, a, there's an updated NASB uh, 2020, but, but I prefer the 95 myself. But uh, I would encourage you, right, to be careful with what translation you're reading because there are people who are trying to change the Word of God. And those changes, even as subtle as they may be, can point people in the wrong direction. We have an incredible responsibility to handle God's Word properly with clarity and accuracy. 
And it's important for us to do as the Bible says in 2 Timothy. Again, Paul is writing to Timothy and he tells him this, knowing that there are going to be people who are going to come into the church and they're going to have false doctrine, they're going to have false theology. And he says, so be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. That we need to study the Bible ourselves. I learned it, you know, from the King James. Study to show yourself approved. Well, actually it says, study to show thyself approved, right? A workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That we need to study the scriptures for ourselves, so that way, whenever somebody says something that doesn't sound right, and if you're a follower of Jesus, right, the Holy Spirit inside of you goes, ding, 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 wait a minute, hold up. Hold up. That don't sound right. Somebody right with that. But if you don't know the word yourself, it's going to be very hard for you to discern that truth. And so all this goes back to who Jesus is, right? All this goes back to understanding that I need to have a relationship with Jesus and it's got to go outside of Sunday morning. It's got to go outside of, of just me, right, playing church. I've got to be part of the church because the church of Jesus Christ is his people. And so the charge has been given. Let me give you an insightful challenge. He goes on and he talks to Timothy and he gives him this challenge. I want you to understand this morning that part of the reason we're talking about this is because according to a 2024 public religion research uh, institute survey, 56% of respondents said they left their church faith because they stopped believing in its teachings. That 56% of people said, yeah, I just left the church because you know what? I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that. Well, what happened? Why don't you believe it anymore? Because you heard a lot of other things that were not true. You choose to believe something that's not true. You choose to believe a lie. Everybody has a choice on what you're going to listen to, what you're going to believe. And so Paul is pointing out to Timothy that not all are going to finish the, face, the, finish the race of faith. Everybody who says they're Christian, when, it all, when the heat is turned on, everybody's not going to hold to the faith. And, and listen, it's getting harder and harder and harder to be, be a Christian. Although I was, I was listening to a, a podcast uh, the other day, and, and they were saying that there seems to be, and we've got to be careful of this, there is a resurgence in what they're calling cultural Christianity. And cultural Christianity is, is all about people who just say they're a Christian because it benefits. You got benefits, right? Or you call yourself a Christian, you say you're, you say you're a Christian, but there's no evidence of Christianity outside of you just saying that, right? So it's like, yeah, you don't really attend church, you don't really pray, you don't really read your Bible, so you're just a cultural Christian, and a lot of people outside of the United States, they all think everybody in the United States is a Christian. They think that, but it's not true. And, and honestly, uh, we, we need to do better at the Christians actually being Christian. <laughs> if, you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you really should, and that should honestly affect every area of our lives. It's not just one thing, right, where we give a little bit of time to, to God or Jesus on Sunday and that's it. And so he says this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Last week there was a, a passage we looked at where Paul talked about two who had shipwrecked their faith, Hymenaeus and Alexander. And, and these were people that were influential in the, in the church or at least in the community. And uh, for whatever reason, right, they walked away from the faith and they were affecting a lot of people. And Paul basically said, you got to get them out of the church. They don't need to be in here because it's, it's, it's like a cancer. It's just spreading throughout. And, and it's important for us, right, to be very careful. And, and this is why we do. We try to protect the pulpit about who's getting up here and who's sharing what. Because influence, right, influence is important. And we all have influence. But we've got to be careful with how we use that influence. 
we've got to be careful to make sure that when we are talking to someone, we're not giving them misinformation, wrong information, and we're not teaching them the wrong things. Because as I've already said, there are plenty of churches out there. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of churches out there, but they are not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of prosperity. It's the gospel of self and self-help. And so this morning, I don't know where your relationship with Jesus is rooted, but if it is not rooted in Jesus Christ and in the Scripture, then I'm telling you this, you are not going to bear good fruit. The Bible says, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I will abide in you, and you will bear fruit, and fruit that will remain. God wants your fruit to remain all the way to the end. That means he wants you to be bearing fruit all throughout your Christian walk. Are you bearing fruit today? To give you another uh, baseball analogy, um, this morning in our prayer time, you know, it was, it was brought up, uh, there were several mentions of, of baseball uh, in our prayer time this morning, and, and uh, everybody didn't know that we were going to have softball players here today until, until after our prayer time ended, um, but... When they were sharing that, it was, it was brought back to my attention, this, this illustration. Um, a famous baseball player uh, was, and you guys all know how it happens. Whenever a baseball player comes up, you know, he gets up there, and especially if he hits a home run, right? Boom. He's probably watching it, celebrating, taking in all the glory, right? And then he's just trotting around the bases. First base, second base third base, and home. I mean, there's no rush. Soak it all in. Well, this particular baseball player got all the way around back to home, and when he got to home, the umpire said, you're out! And the baseball player said, what are you talking about? He's like, didn't you see the ball? It went over! And he said, you're out, not because you hit a home run. You're out because you didn't touch first base. And a lot of us are trying to get home without touching first base. You don't get to heaven without touching first base. And first base is Jesus. A lot of people get shipwrecked in their faith because they're not willing to just go to first base. We can't circumvent Jesus. Jesus is all there is to Christianity. We can't make it about things otherwise. So this morning, let me ask you, have you ever touched first base? Are you trying to get home without Jesus? Because no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are, and listen, I know there's good people in here, but we don't get to heaven by being good. The Bible says even our good deeds are like filthy rags before God. First base is where we start. Do you have the right belief system is your belief in Jesus alone some people who've been Christians for a long time may still struggle with doubt and I want to say that that doubt is not your enemy unbelief is doubt is not a bad thing it's good for you to ask questions it's good for you to ask hard questions don't be afraid I'm not afraid of you asking questions even questions that I can't answer because if I can't answer it I'll say I don't know and sometimes you know you don't need to know either Sometimes we're asking God questions that are completely irrelevant. And we think that we're supposed to know it all. Listen, if you were supposed to know it all, you would be God. There are some things God's just not going to disclose to you, and the reason He's not is because He's God and you're not. And, and so don't be afraid, right, to come to God with questions, but also understand this. God may say, I'm not telling you. Or He may say, that doesn't matter to you. Be obedient. A lot of times we're bringing to God, oh God, I'll do it if, you, if I get this answer. Or God, I'll do it if you, it, God's like, no, will you just follow me because you love me? Because you trust me? Oh God, I got to know, I got to know. And he's like, no, you don't have to know. Because faith, that's what faith is. Faith is following without knowing all the answers. Faith is trusting Jesus even though you don't know how it's going to all work out. Paul was able to say this. He said, I fought the good fight. Listen, a lot of people are fighting a lot of fights these days. Oh my goodness. You can't go anywhere. You can't turn on the TV. You can't watch the news. You can't listen to anything on YouTube without hearing about some fight, right? Something that's going on 
where this person's against that person or whatever. That's not the good fight. Paul said, I fought the good fight. I fought for things that really mattered. And he says, I have finished the race or the course. And I have kept the faith. And that article, the faith, the, is really important. Because there's only one faith. People say, oh, you know, I've got faith. Well, not really. There's only one faith, and that's Jesus Christ. This is why even some other religions are trying to co-opt Jesus. Oh, we're Christians too. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you don't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, then you're not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you have some other way that you think you can become God yourself, I'm sorry, that's not Christianity. Paul says, there's one faith, and I have kept the faith. Faith is the antidote to unbelief. Right? It's not getting all your answers. It's actually moving in the direction that God wants you to go. You see, faith moves forward in spite of doubts. Faith says, I'm going to keep following even though I don't know how it's going to work out, even though I'm tired, even though I've been beat down, even though I've been frustrated, even though, even though. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Bless you. Blessed assurance. Right? I like to do that. I like to do that every time somebody sneezes nowadays, right? Right? Just making sure y'all are still with me, right? Thank you. Yes. By the way, Peyton's 18 today, if you guys didn't know it. Yep. Yeah. So faith continues to move forward, right, even though we may have these doubts. Even though, right, and y'all have heard me talk about this before. When I was running track, I did hurdles. And faith and, and the, the life of Christianity is filled with hurdles. And, you know, I was watching the steeplechase the other day. And if y'all didn't know, I didn't really understand what steeplechase was. That's why I watched it. And so, I mean, they're going over hurdles and these barriers, but then some of those barriers had water. And it's like, what? I mean, are you kidding me? I, it's like, I don't want to be running with water in my shoes, too. Right? But that's, but that's how it is in the Christian life, isn't it? You don't just have hurdles. You've got barriers. And you still got to go over those barriers. And on the other side of that barrier is water. And then that water is getting all over you. And you got to keep going. You got to keep going. In spite of your doubts or in spite of what's coming at you, you're going to have to keep going. Look at what Paul told Timothy. He said, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What does that mean? Be sober in all things. Well, it means this. Stay alert. Right? Stay alert. Now, I've never tasted alcohol, drank alcohol. I've never been drunk. But I understand that when you are inebriated... You don't have a clear sense of direction. You don't have a clear sense of what's going on around you. You can end up doing and saying some foolish things and hurting people, hurting yourself. Right? And so Paul is saying this. Be alert. Stay alert. Don't get drunk on things of this life. And you know what? You can take in a lot of things in this life, man, and it's going to feel good, and it's going to be like, oh, this is so awesome. I, you know, I love being alive. That's great. And then what happens when all that stuff is gone? Oh, you hate life, and you hate God, right? So he says, no, stay alert. Remember, this is not what it's all about. Something more important. So he says, endure hardship. Endure hardship. What does that mean? It means tough it out. Sometimes, right, you're going to have to tough it out. Sometimes you're going to have to do the hard things. Sometimes you're going to have to keep going even though you're tired. But listen to this, Isaiah 40, 31. What does Isaiah 40, 31 say? But, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Think about that. I, I, I've always wondered, why does it say walk and not faint? I, th I feel like if I was running, I'd faint. Right? No, it's because when you quit running and you start walking, that's when everything starts to slow down and you get a good little woozy, right? And he says, no, that even when you come to that point of running and you're exhausted, he says, you, when you're just walking, right, trying to get your heart rate back down, he says, that's when you're more apt to faint. 
He says, so even when you're walking, you won't faint. Tough it out. Then he says, do the work of evangelists. So what does that mean? He says, spread the word. Evangelize, right? Now, a lot of people don't like that word, evangelize, right? But, but Paul's telling Timothy, a pastor, he says, do the work of an evangelist. That means simply spread the word, spread the gospel. That we should be people who know the gospel and can share the gospel. Do you know the gospel? That's part of, that's part of my job is making sure you know the gospel. And if you come on Wednesday nights, right, we're going through a discipleship process. But, but let me just say succinctly what the gospel is, is that Jesus Christ is the perfect son of God who came and lived a perfect life, who died on a cross for us that we deserved and we should have died, and yet he took our place. He was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day, just like he said he would. That's the gospel of Jesus. That you need this Jesus because you can't save yourself. So we need to spread that word. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I could never share the gospel. Yes, you can. You can, if you know it. And then he says, fulfill your ministry. That means complete your calling. What are you supposed to do on this planet? It's what God has given you to do. And many of you may not know what God has given you to do because you've never asked. God, what do you, what do you have me here for? God, what is it you want me to do? God, you've given me these gifts and abilities. How do you want me to use it for your honor and glory? God, show me, and I'm telling you this, God will show you. This is the church, and you guys know this. You guys know this, that if you come to me and said, hey, you know, I think God wants me to do this, I'd be like, great, do it. I, I, I mean, I don't usually have a whole lot of parameters, you know. I mean, are you saved, right? You got the background check? Okay, right? But, but aside from that, listen, we want you to use your gifts for God's glory. We want our church to be a place where your gifts can be um, grown and developed and used to draw other people to the Lord. So you need to ask yourself this question, why are you here? Why are you here? We don't want church to just be consumeristic. We call even this, this service, right? It's an 11 a.m. or a 10 a.m. worship service. And it seems like there are more people who are being served than serving. So when we come to church, right, we should be prepared to serve. We should be prepared to give. We should prepare, be prepared to do whatever might need to be done. And so when we think about, right, we've got to have a, a paradigm shift to understand that, that going to church isn't just about me getting something. It's about me giving. Because there are people around you who could benefit from what you have to give. So why are you here? Finally, an inspiring conclusion. You're like, yes, finally. <laughs> right? Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Some of you may have been down to one of our local restaurants in downtown Atlanta, the Varsity. When you go into the Varsity, what are they saying? What do you have? 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 And man, if you don't know what you're getting into, it's crazy, isn't it? You're like, I don't know what I have. I don't know what I have. What do I have? Well, tell me, what do I have? I don't know. Right? It's like, I don't know what I got. What you got? Right? You got to look at the menu because the thing about it is, right, they call their things different things. I don't know. You know, I'll have a combo, one, two, five, whatever. Right? But I, but I wonder, right, I wonder if God is from heaven saying, what do you have? What do you have? Just like the varsity, you know, God's like, what do you have? What do you have? And I remember, you know, when, when you're in middle school, you're on JV. JV. And your goal is, man, you know, I can't wait till I get to, you know, 10th or 11th grade so I can move up to varsity. Right? I wonder how many of us have just been content to be on the JV team. We're not getting much play time, but that's all right. That's all right. I'm on the team. It's all right. I got the jersey. I don't even need to play. I don't want to get dirty. Got a lot of people today. Listen, I was a Lysol boy. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like to get dirty. You know, man, if I, if, look, last week, man, it drove me crazy. There y'all can tell you. I went out to my car and, I was wearing some tan pants, and I uh, walked outside, and I 
there was a leaf, like a cluster of leaves on my, on my windshield. And so I, I bent to, or I didn't, I bent over to pick it up and pull it off. And my tires were turned a little bit. And so my, my pant leg. And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like I'm late to church. And so I go inside, man, and I get some dawn and I wet that thing down. And I'm like scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing. I'm like, I cannot go to church like this got this tire mark and it was the perfect like the perfect letter from that tire it was right there <laughs> you know some sometimes we're like i don't want to get dirty you know christianity is too messy relationships are too messy but but i'm telling you this this is what god has called us to but sometimes it's going to get a little messy it's going to be a little hard but we endure to the end and so many of us are just content to stay on the sideline and just be part of the JV team. And God is saying, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have that you can offer? What do you have that you can give? It's not even just that. It's who do you have? See, it all comes back down to not what do you have. It's who do you have? And if you got Jesus, then you got something that's more priceless than you even know. Paul said this. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Paul talks about this crown. And listen, as much as God is and, and, and as loving as he is, he's not just going to hand out medals for free not just going to hand out crowns to just everybody because, well, you participated. Yeah, everybody gets a trophy. No, it doesn't work that way. You're only going to get it if you endure to the end. You're only going to get this crown if you follow him faithfully to the end. Did you know that there's five crowns in the scripture? I'm not going to go over all these. I just listed it here because I know some of you might take notes and you can do your own study on this. But, but there's five crowns, the crown of righteousness, the imperishable crown, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, the crown of glory. That, that these five crowns are things that, that God tells us in his scriptures that we can get when we go to heaven. And that, as I just said, you're not going to get them just because he's handing them out freely. He's giving them out to people who have followed his commands, who have done what he wants them to do. And so Paul is at the end of his life and he's encouraging Timothy to do as he has done, to keep going. Don't stop. Timothy, even though it's hard, and even though people may be leaving the faith, you keep the faith. You keep doing what you need to do. And so I want to encourage and challenge you today to do the same thing. That if you're part of God's team, that you don't just have the jersey on and be content to sit on the sideline, but that you would actually say, God, I want to be on varsity I've been looking forward to this. Put me in the game. God, let me use what you've given me for your honor and for your glory. But I do want to remind you that it won't always be easy. There's a story of, uh, and I've shared this years ago, but it's such a compelling and inspiring story of the, the Mexico Olympics, Mexico City Olympics. Um, and the, uh, I think it was the uh, uh, marathon. And there are two gentlemen in there. Mama Wald is the one who won the, the marathon. But John Aquari is the gentleman we're going to look at here in just a moment. There's a video of him we're going to watch. And this is what I want you to understand about John Aquari. Is that, um, and, and quite honestly, many of you didn't even know his name or Mama, Mama Wald who won. But John Aquari uh, has inspired me because he kept running even though everybody counted him out. That he kept running even though he was beat up and bruised and battered. So let's watch this video and then we'll close it out. Just want to highlight what he said. My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. I want you to understand that small little word sent. John Aquari realized, I have been sent to represent. You have been sent to represent. That wasn't in my notes, but it sounds really good. 
you have been sent to represent. John 20, 21, look, look at what that says. It says, Jesus said, as I have been, so send I you. So because we have all been sent, we need to represent. And Jesus didn't come from heaven to earth so that we could quit halfway through. That even though we're racing into the darkness, right, there is a light. And that light is Jesus Christ himself. He has showed us what it means to go all the way to the end. And today, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to recommit to being a person who's not just going to be on the team, but to be a person who's going to play hard all the way to the end. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Today, I don't know what decisions you may need to make, but I would encourage you to consider, first of all, have you touched first base? You can't get home without first base. And so today, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you. And I have to believe that God has been speaking to you about this before you got here. But maybe this is the first time you've considered it. And I want to encourage you that if you've never put your faith in him, that today you would take that step to say yes to Jesus. That you would simply say, yes, Lord. I don't know everything I need to know, but today I want to know you. And I believe that the scripture, when it says this, that anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, right there where you're sitting, you can just say, God, Jesus, I don't know that much about you. I don't understand how all this works. But today, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you died in my place because I have been separated from you. But I want to know you. And today, I want to be called a child of God. Forgive me of my sins. And be my Lord and Savior. Today, if you're praying something like that, I would, I would ask you to let me know so that we can celebrate with you. This is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. It is a life-changing decision. Christians, maybe you're here today and God has spoken to you in some way that you need to rekindle your flame, your passion for the Lord. That... That God may be saying, what do you have? What do you have? Remember who you have. Remember who you have. That you can make a difference. Listen, Mamma Walt uh, won the, the gold medal that year, but people are telling John Aquari's story in churches today. Don't give up. Don't quit. I know some of you are tired and weary. And so today, if... You need to recommit. Let me encourage you. Just do that right where you're sitting. The altar will be open if you want to come and pray to nail some things down. Let me encourage you to do that. God, we thank you so much that you've entrusted us with such an incredible message of hope, Lord, of, of faith, of love, but God, it's also a message that requires us to have endurance, patience, and long-suffering, resilience. God, that we, we must continue to tough it out sometimes. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear your voice and to be encouraged by the challenge that you gave to Timothy. And, Lord, the challenge, Lord, is for us to keep moving forward, keep trusting because you have always been faithful. And so, Lord, today we come to you to renew our commitment, to renew our love, and to say thank you. We pray all these things in the strong and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening. To learn more about us, please visit our website at newvisionc.com and our socials at New Vision Church and NVC Next Gen. Just look for the round broken V logo and we'll see you soon. God bless.